All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started here. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Uh, Andrew Wargo, who is joining us from uh, the University of, or sorry, William and Mary, sorry, at the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences. Um, Dr. Wargo received his PhD from the University of Edinburgh. Can I say that? Yep, Correct. you got oh, it. Good enough. All right. Yep. Uh, where he researches uh, currently the um, uh, drivers of virulence evolution, post pathogen coevolution, and disease math mathematical modeling, amongst other things, uh, using primarily aquatic infectious disease systems as model systems. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Wargo as he talks to us today about the drivers of pathogen virulence. All right, thanks everybody. Can you guys see the slides okay? Should I turn the, the light off in the back? Is everyone good? That's good? Okay. All right. And you guys can hear me in Zoom land? Everybody's happy? Yes. Okay. <laughs> good. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's uh, it's great to be here at Emory and get a chance to speak with some of you. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing in my lab on the drivers of pathogen virulence. And I was asked to back here. All right. I was asked to give a little bit of an overview of my career path up to up to now. So this was a fun exercise of digging up some old photos. Um, so I started kind of in research as an undergraduate at the University of Vermont, working with Joe Shaw, and I was looking at lizard malaria. And this was really fun because I got to go to Puerto Rico and conduct some field work. So this is me with a bunch of lizards and bags. And I was interested in lizards, but I got really interested in, in the malaria side of things. And so I uh, then went on to um, conduct my PhD research at the University of Edinburgh under Andrew Reed, studying rodent malaria, kind of uh, questions related to drug resistance, evolution of virulence. And that's where I overlapped with the after root, faculty in your department. I don't think he's in the picture there, but he was definitely around. And then I kind of shifted gears and moved into a different system, asking very similar questions for my postdoc. I moved to the University of Washington and the USGS Western Fisheries Research Center, working with Gail Kirath and Ben Kerr. Again, kind of looking at questions related to virulence evolution and strain competition, but now in viruses and fish. And then that system really was very tractable and exciting. So I've kind of taken that work with me to my faculty position at uh, BIMS, which is part of William & Mary. So I kind of broadly researched pathogen emergence, evolution, and management, but you'll hear a lot about that today. Okay, so we know that infectious diseases are ubiquitous in the environment, right? Nothing has driven this home more clearly than COVID pandemic. Right, so we're getting used to these things being around. And this is not only a problem for humans, it's also a problem for animals, right? So wildlife species are heavily impacted by infectious diseases. I pulled up a, pic a few pictures here from aquatic systems, because that's mostly what I work on these days. And this is not only true in wildlife, but it's also true in domesticated animals, so companion animals and agriculture. And when we think about disease emergence, what we really want to know is what's the impact of that disease going to be? How severe is it going to be to the population that it's affecting? And so this is where virulence comes in. So I wanted to just write up front, what is virulence? So virulence here, we're defining as the harm of pathogen causes to its host or morbidity and mortality due to infection. And so what we want to know when we're uh, facing a new disease or even an existing disease is at what level of virulence is it going to have? We really want to focus on managing those pathogens that are highly virulent and maybe not so concerned with those things that cause really low levels of disease. The other thing that comes to mind is thinking about why are pathogens virulent? Why would a pathogen want to kill large numbers of its hosts? What's the advantage of that for the pathogen? And if we can answer this question, we can start to think about how we might use that as a management tool. So how can we harness ecology and evolution to manage virulence of pathogens. And this is a powerful tool, right? We can drive pathogens to be less virulent and they're gonna be less problematic for their hosts. So this is kind of the main framework of my research over the last decade or two, is kind of focusing on these questions and thinking about how we might be able to address them. And I wanna talk kind of about sort of main, three main forces that shape virulence today. I wanna to talk a little bit about evolutionary forces. So we'll specifically discuss pathogen emergence and fitness and transmission. We'll then have a little bit of a discussion about anthropogenic forces, kind of focusing in on some farming practices, uh, culling and vaccination, take a little bit of a step back, 
and talk about pollution. And then lastly, I'll talk a little bit about co-infection. And so you kind of see that I've divided these out into three separate categories, but the truth of the matter is they all interact with each other, right? They push and pull each other in different directions. And we've kind of just broken them out here for the sort of the sake of, of ease of argument and discussion. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about evolution and how that might be shaping virulence. So we can't really begin, if I can get rid of this thing up here. Yeah, the more, yeah, right. Like eyes. Eyes, um, right. There. All right. So we can't really have this discussion without thinking about the virulence trade off, right? So this is really the framework that's been proposed for addressing this question of why pathogens are virulence. Okay. So this theory basically relies on this assumption that there's both costs and benefits of virulence to the pathogen, right? So we're thinking about pathogen fitness here. So the, the cost is relatively straightforward. The idea here is that a more virulent pathogen is going to have a shorter transmission duration. So as virulence increases, a pathogen is going to kill its host more quickly, and that's going to truncate the duration in which it can transmit to new hosts. The next part is a little less intuitive. So the idea is that there's this benefit to virulence, and this benefit comes through transmission rate. So we assume here that pathogens which are more virulent may be replicating more quickly inside their hosts. And so they're producing more infectious progeny, they're releasing more infectious progeny into the environment, increasing their transmission rate. But they're also killing more cells, right? They're replicating more quickly, so they're using up more of that host resource. And so this is causing them to have higher virulence. So we take these two assumptions to be true. We see that there should be some sort of balance between the cost and benefit of virulence, which would lead to this intermediate level of virulence, which will optimize fitness. We can think about fitness in different ways. You know, probably the most intuitive way is to think about it as R0, like a population level spread of a pathogen. We're not really going to go too much into R0 today, but just, you know, you can kind of have that as a framework for fitness here. So virulence is optimized at this sort of intermediate level, which maximizes overall transmission. Okay, so we can think about how ecology will shape this, right? There might be situations where we might have a higher cost of virulence, which might push virulence to evolve to a lower level. Or we can think about situations where cost of virulence might be reduced. So maybe this transmission duration cost is reduced and this allows virulence to evolve to higher levels. This could be a moving target. There's been a lot of theoretical work done on this and it's a fairly old theory at this point. But we're still kind of lacking in empirical evidence to support this, you know, experimental studies. So it's a growing body of literature, some individuals in this room have been involved in that work, uh, but it still kind of lags behind the theoretical work that's been done. So this provides an opportunity for us not to only kind of validate this theory, but also think about how we might use it as a management tool. And that's really what I've been kind of focusing on in my research program. So the system that I work on is infectious hematopoietic necrosis virus, or IHNV. IHNV is a negative sense single-stranded RNA virus in the family Rhabdoviridae, so it's related to viruses like rabies. It has this characteristic bullet shape, shown here by the picture in the uh, electrode microscopy image here. And it's endemic in salmonid fishes in the Pacific coast. So it ranges from California all, all the way up to Alaska. It causes an acute disease, which results in necrosis of the kidney and spleen of the fish and ultimately death. You can see here some kind of typical clinical signs. Uh, fish often get this dark coloration and exothalmia or bulging eyes. And this virus is transmitted horizontally through water. So the fish become infected, shed the virus in the water, and then new fish swimming by would pick that up. And this is going to become a little bit more important as we think a little bit about the fitness of this pathogen later on in my talk. Okay, so the other really cool thing about this system is the virus underwent a host jump in the 1960s. So this represents our emergence event. So the virus was endemic in its ancestral host sockeye salmon, where it's probably occurred for several millennia. And sometime in the 60s, it was able to jump into rainbow trout. And it's undergone evolution in that host since that time. And this not only represented a movement from one host species to another host species, it also represented a movement between environments. So it went from being in kind of this predominantly wild, kind of pristine environment into a heavily managed aquaculture environment where rainbow trout 
farming was occurring. And so we can think about how, you know, there's going to be different evolutionary pressures in this aquaculture environment compared to this wild environment. We have a lot of information on the genomics of this virus. So there's been kind of this rapid diversification that's happened since it made this host jump, as you would expect a virus to do in this sort of situation. So it evolved into a new clade, which is labeled the M gene group of the virus, which is predominantly the rainbow trout clade that we're going to be talking about. And you can see that it's really undergone this kind of rapid diversification. And then our ancestral clade is the U gene group virus, which again, just a reminder, this is the sockeye salmon um, clade of the virus. All right, so it also made this geographical uh, movement. So it went from predominantly uh, range from Washington up to Alaska. This is kind of just the native range of sockeye salmon. And then it moved more inland into uh, aquaculture facilities in Idaho and Oregon, where there's kind of this high intensity rainbow trout aquaculture, about 70% of all rainbow trout aquaculture in North America happens in this region. Okay, so once it got into aquaculture, it spread throughout the world, right? So it got into rainbow trout and then it moved across the globe wherever rainbow trout aquaculture was occurring. So we now have, uh, it's endemic basically in Europe, um, Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. And it just kind of keeps kind of cropping up wherever we move rainbow trout aquaculture. It hasn't made it into um, South America yet, but Seems like it's just a matter of time. All right, so it's become a major disease in trout farming. It's probably one of the major, the biggest issues for rainbow trout farming, at least in North America. And it's an OI reportable disease. So it's really important pathogen. This poses a lot of issues for management, but also provides an opportunity. Because it's so heavily managed, there's been lots of sort of isolation of isolates, or, you know, collection of isolates over the last several decades, and these have been archived. So we have about over 3,000 isolates now that have been archived span this host jump to present day. And we're really fortunate to have this. Uh, this is a collection that's managed by the, the USGS Western Fisheries Research Center. And so um, we were able to use this as a resource to answer this question about virulence evolution. And this is work that's being done by my PhD student, Melina Lower. She gave a talk here, I think, EID meeting last year. Uh, and so she developed this really kind of straightforward study design where she looked at different isolates of the virus. So she has isolates from the M clade as well as the U clade. So these are the novel and ancestral clades of the virus. And she chose isolates that span the host jump to present day. So not only sort of spanning the diversity of the phylogenetic tree, but also spanning the temporal sort of range of that host jump event. And she had some, you know, a nice range of the ancestral virus as well as a control. And she did these fully crossed experiments where she exposed both the novel hosts, rainbow trout, and the ancestral hosts to all these different isolates of the virus, sort of a one by one um, pairing. And what she was looking at in these experiments was virulence. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of what this looks like in the laboratory setting, so we're able to culture this virus on cells. So this allows us to get really controlled viral titers that we can use to dose our fish. We expose them through this natural route of transmission. So it's a waterborne exposure. We just basically add the virus to the tank of water. We let the fish get infected and then watch them, let them do their thing. Uh, typically we have about 20 fish per, uh, per tank and about three tanks per treatment. So this is what it looks like in the lab. We have these zebra fish tank systems with multiple tanks in there. Um, and then we just track mortality over the course of the infection. So this gives us a really, a true estimate of virulence. So we can see the number of fish that die, how quickly they die over the course of an infection. And we also can take water samples and track things like viral shedding. I'm not gonna talk about um, the shedding data for this particular experiment that Melina ran, but we'll come back to some shedding data later on. All right, so getting into some data here. So what we're looking at here is mortality over the course of an infection. All right, so cumulative percent mortality and each bar represents a different viral isolate. And you can see that we've arranged these, we've split them by the euclade virus is shown in blue here on the left. And then the uh, M clade here is shown in yellow. And we've also arranged them within clades by the year that they were isolated. So they're from oldest to newest. So the first thing we're looking at is our rainbow trout, our novel host. 
And what you can see is that the M-clade virus is always more virulent than the U-clade. So this represents kind of this host specialization that's happened. Moved into a new host, it's able to cause disease in that new host. What was really interesting about this is this pattern of virulence through time. So it looks like we have kind of this gradual increase in virulence that's continuing to happen as this virus becomes more adapted to its new host. We compare some of the ancestral isolates to the more modern isolates. If we look at sockeye salmon, our ancestral host, we see a very different pattern. So in this case, the euclid is more virulent than the mclade. Again, again, this just represents that host specialization. But we don't see this virulence change through time. And we wouldn't necessarily expect this, right? So remember, I told you that this euclid has evolved in sockeye salmon for several millennia. So we're not necessarily going to expect any recent evolution to occur. Um, so you know, kind of see this sort of stable level of virulence. I mean, there's variation, of course, but there's no consistent pattern in your time. Okay, so what we saw here is that IHNB appears to have evolved increased virulence after it made this host jump. And it's continued to do so through time. And the question we're really left wondering is why? Why would the virus do this? What's the advantage of having higher virulence for this virus? So this gets us back to this fitness question of thinking about a mechanism that might be driving this. So we get back to our virulence trade-off. What we're really trying to do is test these assumptions. Can we see that there's a transmission duration cost to virulence and transmission rate benefit to virulence in our IHNB system? So we've been trying to tease this apart and think about ways that we can test these assumptions and validate them in our system. Sure. Can you go back one slide? Sure. Um, oh, sorry, one more slide. Um, so the top slide there is virulence as, me as measured in the not on the host. This panel, yeah. the top panel. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. No problem. Um, yeah. And so then this would be the ancestral host down here. Yeah. Okay. So we wanted to think about how can we tease apart this relationship and get at these assumptions. Um, so we've, we've gone back to the lab and thought about ways we can characterize virulence. So very similar experimental designs as to what I described earlier. We expose fish to the virus at controlled dosages. And in this case, we're just going to focus on two isolates, which I'm labeling as genotypes. I'll kind of use that term genotype and isolate interchangeably for my talk. So sorry if that's a little confusing, but these are kind of two different genotypes of the virus, which we label HV and LV. And what we do a little differently here is we take these fish and then isolate them into individual tanks. And what this allows us to do is take a water sample from each tank through time to get a shedding profile of the virus. So we'll take a water sample, we'll flush the tank, remove all the virus, hold the water static, let the virus accumulate for 24 hours, take another water sample, and so on and so forth. So do that every day. And we can just quantify our viral load using qPCR. So if you remember, I told you that this virus is transmitted through water. So this is really giving us like a transmission potential profile of the virus. So we can kind of say, okay, your transmission success is going to depend on how much virus you shed, you shed uh, over the course of an infection. So what do we get? So first thing we looked at was mortality. We wanted to see what the virulence difference between these two isolates was. So in this case, HV, if I don't guess that, is the more virulent isolate than LV. And if we look at shedding, we start to see something kind of interesting coming out. So the first thing we notice is that Shedding happens very quickly. So they start shedding within about 24 hours of being infected. It peaks very rapidly. And then shedding tapers as the infection progresses. And we see that the tapering is a little bit more rapid for the low virulent virus than the high virulent virus. So even though these guys, the high virulent virus is killing more fish, it's also maintaining the shedding for longer. Just to make sure that there wasn't something Sorry, weird. Quick. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. real quick. Is that? Um... Amongst all the fish in, in a tank, or so like is mortality might somewhat be driving the, the increases right away, or are we still? Yeah, so these remember these fish are there's only one fish per tank. Yeah. yeah. And then um yeah, that's a good question. Um when a fish stops, when a fish dies, we we don't it does we remove it from shedding. Yeah. They do keep shedding after they die. We can talk about that later if you want, but we remove them. The day after they're found dead from this data. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. All right. So 
it looks like the more virulent gene type has higher shedding. And this seems to suggest that it's going to have a higher transmission rate. Um, just to make sure that this isn't something weird about these viral isolates, we've actually repeated these experiments with different viral isolates and we see a really consistent pattern. So the more virulent isolate always has a higher shedding than the low virulent isolate. Uh, and we're, you know, we're continuing to broaden this. Melina's going to be doing this with like, I think she's up to 25 isolates now that she'll be looking at. Um, but this seems to be a fairly uh, consistent pattern. So if we get back to our virulence trade out hypothesis, we kind of are a little unsure what's going on, right? Like the question here is who's going to win overall? And we have a virus that kills more fish, but it also seems to be shedding more. So it's hard to know who's going to win out in this situation. So we developed some simple models to try to tease this apart, right? So it's just like a simple SIR model framework. Um, and the only thing that's kind of different between sort of maybe a standard SIR model is we have this infected class that can depend on your, the viral genotype which you become infected with. So we subscribe that with a V just to know that they're either infected with the high virulent virus, HV or LV. And then we have parameters which govern movement between these classes or transmission rate. Again, that transmission rate will differ between the HV and the LV virus. Same thing for the recovery rate. It's going to depend on which genotype you're infected with and the death rate. And we just parameterize these models with our data. So we look at the mortality data that gives us a, a death rate. And we look at the shedding data to uh, calculate our transmission rate and our recovery rate. So we assume that once a fish has stopped shedding, it's become recovered. Okay, so it's no longer infectious. And here's what the model looks like. So if we kind of let this epidemic run at a population level for about 300 to 400 days, we see that early on, it looks like the low virulent virus kind of has a little advantage initially, and then it quickly gets um, like sent to extinction and the high virulent virus becomes dominant in the population. So it looks like at a population level that the high virulent virus has greater transmission success and overall fitness is higher. Okay. We're going to move on to the next part. So, if you have any burning questions? I have sort of a silly one. You said you were working with trout and salmon, right? Yes. Those tanks are so tiny. I feel like those fish are so large. Are They're they... pretty small. So, like, really? the fish are like, that yeah, we work with juveniles because like gotcha. we, we don't work with adults and we could talk. There's a lot of reasons why yeah. the most obvious reason is that like you need a tank that was sure. I mean, like that. Sure. So is there any difference that you would expect in an adult population with these sort of transmission dynamics? Yeah, so adults are the biology. Um, as they get older, they become more resistant to disease, mm -hmm. clinical disease, but adults are really important for transmission yeah. in the wild. Um, so even though they're not necessarily getting as sick, they're transmitting it a lot because they're okay. around a lot. So yeah, we might expect different things, but like feasibly we can't work with it in the lab. Yeah. 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 So all right, I'll take like maybe two more quick questions for it. Um just to clarify, I'm sorry if you mentioned this. The high variant and the low variant bothers were they both the M microclade? Like, yes. M and U okay. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I didn't actually clarify that. Those were both M clade. Okay. It's not always the case. Um, most everything that we did that I've shown you is M clade. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, go for it. I have already asked. So, to clarify the, the model from the data that you have, um, you sometimes you get some kind of assumptions about how far shedding actually translates into transmission. Yeah. Um, what are, what were the assumptions? Yeah, so we have a little bit of data, which I didn't show you. Um, we know, um, We've done dose response experiments with those two genotypes, so we can kind of use that as like a probability infection given a certain mm -hmm. dose. And then we can sort of model in, okay, what's the dose of virus that's being shed to make those connections and come up with like a transmission term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So linear with um, the mass virus or it's usually like uh, it's, it's long linear. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'll move on. We'll have time for questions at the end, I hope. Um, all right, so we kind of we sort of wrap up this evolutionary forces thing. It looks like IHMDs evolved increased virulence, and this seems to be driven by transmission duration. Okay, so now let's think about some anthropogenic forces. And what we're really thinking about here is aquaculture, right? So aquaculture is this really high intensity operation for trout farming. So you have these really big farms, and 
the scale here is kind of hard to get an appreciation for, but these little black squares are what we call raceways, and those squares can hold up to like 150,000 fish each. And you'll have maybe like dozens to hundreds of those on a given farm. And then on a given river, there will be multiple sites, right? So you could have, you know, 10 to 20, 30 sites on a, a given river. So there's a lot of intensity here. Um, and there's a lot of things that are different about that than that wild environment I showed you earlier um, that could drive evolution. And we don't have time to talk about them all today, but I just want to talk about two things that happen in aquaculture um, that are kind of interesting. So culling and vaccination. All right, so we'll start with culling. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with culling, so the way that we define culling is euthanasia of a host population when mortality reaches a certain threshold. So Imagine that you are a fish farmer and you've got multiple raceways on your farm and you see a disease outbreak on one raceway and you want to prevent the spread of whatever's in that raceway to other raceways in your facility. So just come in and you say, okay, mortality reaches a certain level. I'm going to remove all the fish and euthanize them from that raceway. And I'm not going to worry about who's infected and who's not because I can't really sort them out. I'm just going to clear everybody out. So this is used pretty extensively in aquaculture, particularly with young life stage fish because they're a fairly low value product. Um, we have other high profile cases like foot and mouse disease where you kind of, this occurs from sort of a biosecurity um, standpoint. What we want to think about is how this might drive virulence evolution. So imagine you've got these two populations which become infected with one with a low virulence strain of a virus and one with a high virulence strain. And we know from our previous research that about the same number of fish become infected with these two strains. That's kind of the data I showed you earlier. But what really differs is the number that die. So about 20% might die that are infected with a low virulence strain. Maybe about 80% will die that are infected with a high virulence strain. And if we think about our culling threshold of, say, 30%, we can see that the high virulent infected population is going to reach that threshold and get culled, whereas the low virulent population may not. So it might escape culling. So this might provide an opportunity for this low virulent pathogen to have an advantage. And if we get back to the, the virulence trade-off, what we're really doing is we're kind of forcing this trade-off to sort of become more present. So as virulence increases, the likelihood we're going to cull a population is going to go up. And so we're, we're increasing that transmission duration cost of virulence. In theory, this might select for a lower virulent pathogen to optimize its fitness. I've been talking a lot today, so my voice is starting to feel it. All right, so let's test this with IHMB and see if this actually holds up in our system. Okay, so we went back to our data and sort of thought about, okay, what is this going to look like? So just looking at that mortality and shedding data that I showed you earlier, if we set our pulling threshold to 30%, you can see that this high real infected population reaches that threshold around day six or seven. So we basically would wipe out all the shedding of the virus from that point forward. So we're moving that kind of part of the red curve down there at the bottom. And what this might do is provide a little window where a low virulent virus has the advantage. So as it turns out, I'd love to test this experimentally, but you can imagine like conceptually that's very hard to do, right? We have to create really large populations. We'd have to like have coal some and not coal others, allow the virus to go undergo evolution. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of a way to do it, but we wanted to start with building some models first to see if this even works out um, sort of mathematically. So just take our little model framework, which I described to you earlier, and we kind of scale it up to a farm level. And we'll have a model that basically we could model raceway as like little populations with their own little SIR models. We could have as many raceways as we want. I'm just going to show four here for the sake of argument. We have a migration term, which allows the virus to move between raceways. Um, it's kind of weighted on the amount of virus that's being that's shed in that raceway, um, which governs this kind of movement of virus between raceways. But what's really kind of interesting is the culling thing. So we come in, we track the number that are dying in a raceway, and once it reaches our threshold, we cull that population. So we set everything back to zero. Sure. Uh, just a simple question. How, how does our cost, how does the virus cost? In the real world? Yeah. yeah, so there's a lot of ways that it could happen biologically. So like probably the most obvious thing is like a net being dipped across raceways or a fish being moved. Um, 
or you know there's other like sort of vectors that could move it. The flow in a rate in a farm, the way that water flows is pretty complicated. It like it can it kind of comes in and then it'll go down and there's a series of raceways. So it, it can move in down stream, like you'll have raceways in series that can can move down, but how it moves sort of parallel is a little bit more complicated. We didn't really try to simulate like the actual patterns of movement in a real facility. That'd be really cool to do. Um, we're just sort of seeing in a general sense, like this kind of like risk of movement is based on the pressure in a given raceway is more likely to spill out if there's more virus there. Yeah. All right, so let this model run. Um, so just to show you like our model without culling again, remember the high virulent one wins out. And when we allow culling to come in here, we basically cull out those high virulent infected populations very quickly and it gets driven to extinction within like a matter of 10 days. And then this low virulent virus is able to kind of persist in the population for, for quite a long time. Eventually mortality will reach a high enough level that it'll also sort of signal the culling to occur. Um, so eventually it does kind of get moved out as well, but there's this really long period where it has the advantage. All right, so it seems to suggest that in the presence of culling, low virulence might be favored. All right, so let's move into uh, vaccination. So there's been quite a bit of theory on this idea of vaccine-induced virulence evolution. Um, sure, many of you are familiar with this theory. I just kind of want to set it in the framework of our fish system. So let's imagine that we have a fish which becomes infected with a virus. And for the sake of argument, let's assume that this virus is so pathogenic and so virulent that it kills its host before it can transmit. It's kind of a dead end. It's like this extreme case of virulence where it's just killing it so rapidly it has no transmission. Let's imagine we have that same fish, we vaccinate the fish, and for the sake of argument, this vaccine provides disease protection, so it provides uh, protection against clinical disease, but it's non-sterilizing, so it allows for infection and transmission to still occur, right? So what we've done here is created the scenario where a virus which would normally kill its fish is able to persist in a vaccinated fish because that fish has protection against clinical disease due to the vaccine. And so then potentially that virus could go on to transmit to new hosts. So we're kind of maintaining this highly virulent strain of the, of the virus that would normally burn out. Right. Okay. And so if we think about our virulence trade-off, really what we've done here is we've reduced that transmission duration cost of virulence through vaccination. We've kind of allowed these fish that are infected with highly virulent strains to, to live for longer and potentially allow the virus to evolve a higher level of virulence. So this theory was presented by Gannon and all back in 2001, and there's been a lot of development of the theory since then. Um, and there's some evidence from real world systems like uh, Merrick's disease um, and um, some work in finches showing that like this could work out, this could play out, right? There could be an indication that virulence evolution occurs as a result of vaccine protection or immunity. So we wanted to see if this applied to our system and think about like what conditions would be necessary for this to happen. So first we need a, a vaccine which reduces clinical disease. That's kind of the obvious thing. We also need this relationship between transmission rate and virulence. And we need a vaccine that is non-sterilizing that allows for infection and transmission. So we went back and looked at our data to try to see if these hold up. So this is work that's been done by a previous graduate student of mine, Darby Jones, and a postdoc, Juliette Dumeiru. And they did a lot of different experiments. I only can show a few of the uh, slides today, but first what we looked at was uh, clinical disease. And so we allow fish to become infected in the absence of the vaccine, and we see really high mortality. So in this case, we had close to 100% mortality in fish that were unvaccinated. We go in and we vaccinate those fish, we're able to bring survival almost up to 100%. So really, really strong vaccine protection against clinical disease. All right, so this is kind of the obvious thing. If your vaccine doesn't protect against clinical disease, you kind of have a, a bad vaccine, right? So we really wouldn't even go any further. So the next thing we wanted to look at was transmission rate. And this is just kind of getting back to the data I showed you earlier. We already know that there's this positive relationship between transmission rate and virulence in this system. So the next thing is the hardest ingredient to kind of figure out. It's like, do vaccines allow for infection and transmission? 
And so what we wanted to assess here was the vaccinated host shed the virus, because that's our method of transmission, our mode of transmission in the system. So we vaccinate our fish and then we expose them to the virus and then we isolate them into individual tanks and take water samples like I described earlier. And we have a lot of data on this. We have a lot of data at different doses of the virus, different doses of the vaccine, uh, kind of different situations of host types and boiling it down to two plots, which is always sort of a little demoralizing. But um, what you can see is that the vaccinated host shed virus, right? So pretty much all of those fish that are vaccinated shed the virus. And although the amount of virus that they're shedding is reduced, there's still enough there to, um, you know, potentially to transmit. Okay, so we've got all these ingredients, right? For virulence evolution to occur, that doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna happen, right? We can have all the ingredients to make a cake, but those mean we know how to bake a cake and it's gonna necessarily happen. So we wanna take this a step further and we conducted these serial passage experiments to see if we could actually observe uh, virulence evolution as a result of vaccination. So we vaccinate our fish, and then we expose them and let them become infected to our virus. And then we add a new group of naive fish to the tank, let them become infected, move them to a new tank, let them start sharing virus, keep doing this for multiple passages. We add new fish at each passage step. At the end of each passage, we isolate those fish and harvest the live virus from them. We can archive that for later characterization. And in this particular experiment, I think we went up to 16 passages. And the thing that's kind of key here is that we would expect that this is probably gonna be a rare event and there's gonna be a lot of evolutionary things that can happen. So we wanted to try to maximize as much replication as we could. So we had 18 replicate lines for treatment uh, the other thing that I would note is that we not only passage through vaccinated fish, but we're also passaging through our sham vaccinated fish. So we have this control of does passaging itself cause any kind of evolution. All right, so we bring back these isolates and then we quantify virulence. So the first thing we looked at was how well do we maintain transmission across our passages? So at each passage step, we can see is virus being shed? Is there, is there virus in the water? Are they getting infected and shedding it? And so what we see is that the transmission drops off um, pretty quickly. This is kind of expected in these experimental evolution studies where we're doing serial passage. The ability to maintain passaging gets difficult as time goes on. Um, but one thing that was really interesting was the, the one treatment where we were able to maintain the longest transmission was in this vaccinated case. So this suggested to us there might be a vaccine escape unit that's able to break through and continue to go through this passaging. So we're really interested to understand the phenotype of that. So we went back and characterized the phenotype of, I think, five isolates from our unvaccinated passage virus and our vaccinated passage virus and compared that to the ancestral virus. We saw a lot of variation, right? So in some cases we get increases in virulence. In some cases, we get decreases in virulence. Um, it's all kind of hovering a little bit around that sort of ancestral virulence. So there's not really a strong pattern that necessarily it's always going to drive virulence evolution in this case, right? And you can kind of think about experimentally, this is a challenging thing to, to um, assess, but it gave us an indication that vaccine escape can probably occur we're still unsure whether that's associated with virulence evolution, but there's sort of the potential for that to happen. All right, so I don't necessarily need to make this public service announcement for this audience, but I get often asked when I give this talk, it's like, so are vaccines good or bad? Should we use vaccines? So like vaccines are a really important management tool, right? They've been critical in us managing a lot of pathogens, including COVID. And so really the goal about this work is thinking not about like, should we or should we not use vaccines, it's about how can we build better vaccines? So as we're developing new vaccines or thinking about uh, modifying existing vaccines, can we develop vaccines that are going to be transmission blocking? And those are gonna be more, uh, potentially more sustainable. They're gonna maybe mitigate this issue with virulence evolution. And this isn't always gonna be possible, right? We may not have the opportunity like in COVID to really think about this. We need something that we can roll out quickly. But we're thinking about a system like aquaculture, um, managing diseases in an aquaculture environment. There's probably a little bit more leeway. They can think these things through a little bit um, more 
extensively before they maybe roll out a vaccine. All right, so kind of finishing up the discussion about um, culling and vaccination and thinking a little bit more broadly about what else might be different about sort of a managed perspective or anthropogenic effects on diseases. And we kind of jumped into this pollution world. Um, and the big thing that all of us are hearing a lot about is plastic pollution, right? So plastics are everywhere. They're all over the place. They're in the air, they're in the soil, they're in the water. And, you know, we know that they're breaking down into microplastics, right? These really small particles. And there's increasing evidence that these are having direct effects on animal health. But what we don't really have a good understand it, as understanding of is these indirect effects. So how does plastic exposure increase susceptibility to infectious diseases or other uh, stressors in the environment? And we can think about this from a virulence perspective. Is plastic exposure influencing the virulence or sort of the virulence being the type of a pathogen? Okay, so this was some work that was um, conducted by another graduate student who worked in my lab, Meredith Seeley, and she kind of designed these really elegant studies where she looked at different microparticle types. So she had two plastics, nylon and polystyrene, and then she had a, a microparticle control, Spartina, which is kind of a naturally occurring um, microparticle in the environment, and then of course our no microparticle control group. She exposed fish to either the, the microparticle alone, the virus alone, or co-exposure of the two. And then the other thing that she did, was, which was really important, was this dose response, was to see at different concentrations of plastic exposure, do you get a different effect? Okay, so here's what she found. It's a lot of data at once, but we'll kind of go through this. So the first thing that you're gonna notice when we look at these sort of survival curves over time, that when you don't have virus around, you don't get any mortality. So that's all the dotted lines. So they're all kind of on top of each other at the top of the graphs. Regardless of whether or not the plastic's there, if there's no virus, they don't get mortality. So the plastic by itself isn't really causing a lot of clinical disease. Uh, but once you add the virus in, things get more interesting. So the virus by itself, you have about 80% survival. And then as you increase the dosage of the plastic, you increase your mortality. And this effect was strongest with the nylon, the nylon fibers. And we saw a significant effect with polystyrene, but no significant effect with Spartina. Okay, so it looks like, you know, this plastic exposure is exacerbating susceptibility to the, to the pathogen. We don't really know what the mechanism is at this point. We have some hypotheses. Um, you'll notice that the effect was the biggest in the nylon case. And it turns out these nylon are actually little fibers. They're kind of long, thin particles. And we think it's something about the shape of that that is really causing a lot of inflammation and damage in the gills of the fish that's potentially allowing the virus to get better establishment and replicate kind of a little bit of a replication advantage early on. Um, whereas these like rounded particles like polystyrene aren't having as much of an effect. Um, so that's what we're kind of looking at now is whether it's like chemical composition or the shape of the plastic that's really important here. Okay, so the other thing that we haven't done, but I'd love to do is thinking about evolution, right? So how is this going to shift the evolution of the pathogen? And um, sort of laying in that question about virulence, like is higher low virulent pathogens affected more by this? Um, what does this look like from a transmission perspective? So that's kind of the next step that we're moving into. All right, so we'll end by talking about co-infection. Uh, so this is also some work that we've kind of been thinking about for several years. And again, I don't need to really tell anyone in the audience this, but you know, we know co-infections are really common, right? We look at hosts in the environment, they're typically harboring a lot of different pathogens at one time. A lot of our research is really focused on single infections. That's really from a logistical standpoint, that makes sense. We kind of need to know what's happening in a single infection before we add complexity. And where the studies have been conducted, we know that co-infection often alters disease dynamics and severity. There's a lot of work that's been done on this question about co-infection and selecting for increased virulence. Some individuals here have done some work on this. Um, this is through this idea of the tragedy of the commons. I'm not gonna talk about tragedy of the commons today. Um, it's, it's a really interesting topic. 
What I've been kind of focused on is sort of this idea about how co-infection might impact disease management, particularly vaccination and how we look at vaccine effect and efficacy. All right, so our study system, again, is IHMB, uh, which the virus described to you earlier. And we have this bacteria, labeled bacterium sacrophyllum, which is also prevalent in the environment. So uh, flavor bacterium is kind of ubiquitous opportunistic. So it's like always there, it's pretty much in all aquatic environments. And it basically causes issues when the fish are stressed or if there's like certain strains of the bacteria, it can get disease issues. That's probably the number two pathogen that they worry about in rainbow trout aquaculture in North America. So our hosts here are salmonids again. And both these pathogens cause this acute disease. So in the case of FP, we get this necrosis of, of um, skin tissues, which can result in death or a, a product that they can't use, they can't sell it. Uh, so it's an unmarketable product. All right, so what do our experiments look like? We have our host and we vaccinate these hosts against IHMD. So we have this really effective IHMD vaccine. So we're vaccinating them against the virus. And then we're exposing them to either a single infection of each pathogen, so IHMD alone, FD alone, or co-infection. We do our isolation again, and we quantify shedding of each pathogen. So we have quantitative PCR that's specific to each pathogen type. And then we also track mortality. So let's look at the survival data first. So here we're just showing the virus by itself without vaccines. So in this case, we had about 80% survival. So we chose a dose where we didn't completely kill all the fish, but we got a little bit of mortality. We come in and we vaccinate those fish, we get 100% survival. So again, this vaccine is really effective at uh, protecting against clinical disease. If we look at the bacteria, again, in the absence of vaccination, we see uh, about 60% survival. So kind of this moderate level of survival. The vaccine provides a little bit of protection. This is cross protection from the vaccine. Again, remember this vaccine is targeted against the virus. Um, we're still kind of teasing out why there's cross protection there, but we get a little bit. And then things get really interesting when we look at co-infection. Okay, so in this case, we get a lot more disease when the, the two pathogens are present together, right? Mortality just goes really, really high. And if we vaccinate those fish, we're able to reduce that, but we can't bring it back to the level of a single infection. So we have reduced vaccine <clears throat> efficacy in the presence of co-infection. If we look at shedding, um, we have a lot of shedding data, just kind of simplifying it here. The first thing you'll notice is kind of this facilitation response. So the, the virus and the bacteria both shed more when they're in the presence of the other pathogens that they do by themselves. So there's this facilitation mechanism going on. And this also shows us reduced vaccine efficacy. So this increase in shedding, we're able to reduce it with vaccination, but we're not able to bring it back to the level of a single infection. So really our vaccine efficacy is really diminished in this co-infection scenario. Again, we haven't really thought too much about the evolutionary consequences of this, but it would be interesting to kind of go there next and think about, okay, if we do have this facilitation response, how might be shaping the, the virulence of these two pathogens in an evolutionary perspective. All right, so co-infections seem to lead to higher virulence and reduced vaccine efficacy. So we kind of get back to, just to kind of finish up here, getting back to like my main overarching question. Can we harness disease ecology evolution to manage virulence? This is a big question that's been debated in the literature over the years. I hope it showed you that potentially through choline, we have a, a, a mechanism that might allow more selection for less virulence. We need to see if this plays out in a experimental perspective and maybe from an actual um, with field data, but the modeling seems to suggest there's something there. From the vaccine perspective, we have observed that the vaccine can allow for vaccine escape. And the question is how that's related to virulence. I've been thinking about how we can kind of scale up these experiments to maybe get a better handle on virulence evolution in that scenario. In the case of plastics, I had a few discussions this morning about this. It's a very difficult question to manage, right? We have plastics in the environment. They're not going away. And so the way that I think about this is it gives us more information that we can make better assessments of risk. We think about a population that might be affected by an infectious disease. We know there's a lot of plastic exposure in that environment. We might want to include that into our calculations of the disease risk in that population. 
And the same kind of story with, with co-infection, right? If we know co-infections around, if we're going to try to develop realistic estimates of vaccine efficacy, we probably need to consider the important co-infections in those situations, in those systems. All right. A lot of people involved in this over the years. I uh, can't thank everyone. A lot of this was driven by students, as you saw. So really appreciate all their hard work on this. And thanks to my funding agencies. And thanks to all you guys for showing up. Attention. I'll take any questions. Sure. Um, the first is uh, at the beginning of your talk, you're kind of showing like the biology of all the different strains of the uh, genome groups. Mm -hmm. Are are they uh, antigenically distinct, or it seems like there's one vaccine? Does it provide? Ah, uh, yeah, against? that's a good question. Um, yeah, so the vaccine, we haven't. There hasn't been a lot of that work. A lot of work done on that. There's been a little bit. So it seems like the vaccine is pretty cross protective against like the different. Like the, if we use an M vaccine, an m clade vaccine, it seems to protect against you pretty well. Again, most of that is all based on mortality yeah. data. So when it comes to like infection levels, probably there's very little data on that. Um, but yeah, it does a pretty good job. I think we could do a little bit more work on that though. Yeah. Uh, and then the second question, I guess, is about um, all neck sizes and whether, um, like obviously in I'm more familiar with like human viruses. We think about how bottleneck sizes sort of constrain the evolutionary potential yeah. of, of those viruses. But in aquatic systems, it seems like those bottleneck sizes would be much larger, if at all. There's sort of the water and then everything's like moving yeah. around in the water. Um, but in in the um, kind of facilities and pictures that you're showing, um, you talked a little bit maybe about how water kind of goes down through the mm -hmm. runways, but then also there might be um, like smaller events of transmission sort of between parallel like tracks. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm wondering the extent to which like in natural or or like aquaculture systems bottleneck size either is not at all like a factor in the evolutionary like pathway of this virus or, or impacts it. Um, yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, I were talking about this earlier a little bit. It's like uh, we have done a little bit of work on trying to estimate the bottleneck size in this system doing like some co-infection, co-exposure studies uh, and looking at like co-exposure to different ratios and seeing how many become infected with a mixed infection and kind of using like a binomial distribution to estimate it. Somewhere in the range of like five to 20 viral particles. So it's pretty like, it's yeah. kind of similar to what you'd expect to be human virus. But um, yeah, so we know that that's happening, but you know, what we don't have a good handle on is like that's, very much in like a laboratory setting under one controlled exposure dose and in the environment in an aquaculture facility there's probably a lot of other things going on there's a lot of stressors in that environment um i think what we would probably say is that what i think probably happens I mean, this is actually a question i've thought a lot about it's like how does an epidemic play out in a facility it's like what i think probably happens is like we know the probability of a fish becoming infected is pretty low but once it does, what probably happens is that it ramps up, like the initial introduction is kind of a rare event, but then once it gets in there, the fish becomes infected, starts shedding a lot. Yeah. And there's like this proximity thing there. It's such a high density environment that it's able to spread through very quickly, you know? So I think it like, it gets initiated and then it kind of takes off. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's it's an interesting question about like, there might be different bottlenecks like you're talking about when you're talking about movement horizontally versus serially through the facility. The thing that's kind of strange is that some early literature where they looked at like mapping epidemics on farms, it's not like the way you would expect that it's like one series of breaks where it just all breaks out. It's like they get like these sporadic epidemics throughout the facility. Um, and so we haven't really been able to make sense of that. Um, I think there's issues with like testing and how well they're actually like looking because they're all focused again on disease, right? So they're looking for mortality. And so that's triggering them to go in and test. Um, but yeah, the movement through a farm in between farms is something that we don't have a good handle on and I'd like to know a little bit more about. But yeah, there's got to be bottlenecks that are happening. So what's that doing to genetic diversity? So that's one of the reasons like we use to kind of explain 
So everything you saw here is like, why isn't this virus just virulent? Like, there's nothing here to tell me that this virus should not be virulent. What the data that shows you today, but when we look at in the field, there's a massive amount of diversity of virulence. Like you go up and take, you collect, uh, we have isolates that span the spectrum. And so what might be happening is like the structuring where you get like these little, like sort of little populations that are structured on farms that because of like what you're talking about bottlenecks, it can't really move super well between facilities that it kind of creates these little mini populations perhaps. But, um, Thanks. Sorry, it's a long answer. To no, your question, so. Yeah. I'm wondering more on the, on the host side of the rainbow track, given kind of how, you know, what you were showing beforehand about how um, highly virulent some of these strains are that are in the agricultural systems. Um, has there been any, um, I guess, uh, resistance evolution or tolerance evolution kind of in, in the rainbow track? Yeah, so I mean, they've done a lot of work with selective breeding at, on, on farms. So that's something that we're interested in exploring um, to try to manage this from a, a natural ecology perspective. Um, I think we do have evidence that there's natural variation that some populations of trout that have never been exposed to the virus are way susceptible, way more susceptible than ones that have had evolved with it. Um, so yeah, there is definitely natural variation in resistance. Um, so the population that we've used for most of, actually we used a couple different ones. So the one that we used for um, Molina's work, we're looking at like that virulence evolution question with your time. We tried to go back as well as we could to the like historical fish that would have been around when the host jump occurred, but we can't, it's impossible because rainbow trout have been so heavily managed that they basically got bottlenecked down to this like one or two populations and then that was used to see throughout the world. Um, but we do have a population that has not undergone any like human selection that we use for that one. So it's like at least kind of an unselected line. And then a lot of the stuff I showed you with the, the farming data that we did, we also have a line of fish that we get from a fish farmer that they've done some selective breeding. So we have different lines and do have different systems, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, kind of along those lines um, from online, we've got a question about how it seems that the data from the start of the presentation showed that this species jump gave rise to this um, rapid uh, virulence increase mm -hmm. over time. Yeah. Um, and this person was wondering um, that it seems like it is kind of in contrast to what we can expect about it, attenuation um, right. from uh, in the trend. So, yeah, so we don't, yeah, we've kind of blown that out of the water, right? Like, so that that's sort of the idea, right? Is that like everyone thinks that things are going to emerge and become a virulent, but as we look at more and more systems, the evidence just isn't there. Like even in the classic, you know, uh, Mixoma virus, you know, case is like it went down in virulence, but it become a virulent. It became like it still maintained. That's where the trade off theory comes from. Is like it's still pretty darn virulent at that intermediate level. So. And things like HIV and um, other systems where they've looked at this, like it doesn't look like things are going to become a virulent, but they may go up or down. So what we are trying to contrast with this system is like we had something that in the case of uh, Mixoma, it was like really highly virulent when they introduced it. That was a point. Here we started with something that was relatively low virulence when it kind of made the host jump. So where's it going to go from there? So in our case, it kind of went up. Um, but yeah, those theories are, I guess, need to be. A little bit more considered. Um, but yeah, there's I think there's other systems too that have kind of evidence. And it's gonna depend on the ecology of the system, right? And that's what's kind of getting at. It's like there may be systems where like that low virulence thing works out. And we can think of pathogens that are in humans that are relatively low virulent that do pretty well. Um, but we can also think of a lot of others that are high virulent that do really well too, from their perspective. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I have a silly question. Um so you mentioned like in your transmission studies that you remove all the water and measure the amount of virus in the cell. And I've just always heard that the being fish takes that you don't remove all of the water. Ah, right. Yeah, I didn't mean that quite that way. Uh, so yeah, they have to always be in the water. We flush it. So like basically, you know, they're in a tank with water. We turn the water off, flow off, so they're just static. And then we leave them static for 22 hours. We let the virus accumulate and we take our sample and then we turn the water back on and just flush all the water out of the tank with clean water. So we're removing the virus. But yeah, no, we're not like, we're not keeping them out of the water. Although sometimes we will take a fish and move it to a new tank in a clean, like a new clean tank, just netting it across. But yeah, they can't survive out of the water. 
Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. Sort of the, the, the details are kind of complicated sometimes. Um, yeah, especially in those serial passage experiments, just thinking about like, okay, how do we keep the regional virus from just like staying in the tank? And yeah, those were big. Yeah. Well, it is one o'clock, so uh, thank you, Dr. Martin.